Jury selection is underway in the murder trial of Adam Montgomery. He's charged with the murder of his daughter, Harmony Montgomery, a little girl, five years old at the time, who went missing, but no one even knew she was missing for almost three years. It took that long for authorities to finally close in and say, hmm, there's something wrong here. Also, the family where mom was an addict and the court thought, this man was a better fit for Harmony Montgomery. Joining me to discuss, Dr. John Delatore. John, let's start at the beginning of this case uh, where, I mean, it's troubling enough to me to, to, to hear that this poor little girl, I mean, she really was dealt a horrible hand, no matter any way you look at it. Mom's an addict, and somehow uh, this man, uh, Adam, is looked at as a, a better or more fit parent uh, than, I guess, in some sort of a foster care system. Uh, is this something where the, the system is initially to blame or is this, you know, something where at that point in time, Adam Montgomery was a better fit than, than a, a foster family? Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting case in that I do think that there, that this little girl, her case kind of went, fell through the cracks a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think, I do think that um, the child welfare agency has some blame in what ultimately happened. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that they should be held criminally liable. I do think that they might be civilly liable. But there is there is definitely uh, – this little girl should always have had eyes on her, mm -hmm. and she didn't. And during those times when she didn't have eyes on her, uh, someone did something – uh, that was truly, truly awful, mm -hmm. truly monstrous. And uh, this little girl, as you said, never really had a chance. And, and that's unfortunate because uh, everyone deserves a chance. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, I don't know what the circumstances were where they, they, they saw initially that, that, that Adam was a better fit than mom. Uh, maybe things escalated after that moment. I mean, to the point where, you know, they're living in a car uh, and, what obviously happened here, and we've learned in the affidavits and the testimony of, of many people that were part of the situation or around the situation, uh, Kayla Montgomery and others, uh, the allegations are that uh, you know she was wetting herself in the car. Uh, yeah, kids will do that, especially when they don't have access to a bathroom, and that's where he fatally uh, hit her and, and then carried her around in a duffel bag for months and months and months and they didn't seem to have really any forms about it including the girlfriend uh, being part of it just kind of going along with uh, with this way of thinking uh is this a, a, a scary scary look into the world of addicts and what they're capable of doing um you know or is this what are we looking at here with, with someone that was capable of of, of doing something like this for such a long period of time and then seeming to have little to no regard whatsoever when being confronted about it. Yeah, I think it actually goes the other way. I think we're looking into a world in which an individual is capable of violence, but for whatever reason is mostly restrained until they start using the drugs. Drugs don't ever really make you violent. Not really. Um, what they do is they lower your inhibitions and you can engage in behaviors that you wouldn't have done if you weren't on those drugs. And so I think what we see here is someone who was possibly very abusive just in general mm -hmm. and the drugs that he was using uh, made him even more so. It's it's a very uh, troubling uh, case anyway. Uh, anyway, you, you look at it. Um, when we're going to be, you know, taking this now to trial, the all this evidence is is going to to be coming out. Um, is there anything, I guess, to be uh, to be learned on on this uh, in terms of a child welfare of what what can be done better? next time. I mean, the fact that this little girl was missing for three years, I mean, it says a lot that there wasn't anyone in her life to raise the red flag for the most part to say there's something wrong here, that this girl has not been missing for a week, but literally about three years. 
before that actually uh, came to light. Um, it makes you wonder how many other uh, how many other uh, little girls like this are, are out there. How many other little Kaylas are are missing that we are completely unaware of because of a, an overloaded system. Too many. Too many little boys and girls have gone missing. Too many little boys and girls have been abused, have been discarded, have been uh, killed, murdered. Too, there's there's too many of them to, to even possibly count. And so I think we are – this is another one of those tragic cases that reveal just how underfunded and overworked the child welfare system is, but also – you uh, there's uh, and I'm not again I'm not trying to excuse some of the uh, you know some of the case managers here but this also goes to show you that sometimes yes you do have to pick the lesser of two evils to keep families intact but if you're going to do something like that then you need to make sure that you're constant that that person that you put in the lesser of two evils that you're constantly monitoring them you can't lose sight of of, of those individuals cuz stuff like this happens yeah, it, it's scary. It's sad. Uh, one of the things that I know we've see, seen stats on here um, it, over the last handful of years, uh, specifically uh, with COVID, um, where so many kids went out of school, out of the school system. They were shut down. Uh, and and then everybody goes back into school. But there's a lot that never returned. Uh, and where are those kids? Um, it, there's certainly not enough case managers out there to to take a look at this. Why is it? I mean, this seems to be a very ongoing black eye in our country that we have uh, in terms of, of our care for children, especially the less fortunate kids, kids that are uh, unfortunately in the care of mentally ill parents. Uh, and, and we just kind of, well, good luck. Let's see, hopefully you, you show back up at school. Uh, does, does there need to be more resources put into this area? And why aren't there more resources in this area looking after our most valuable asset are, are, are kids. Well, it's a double-edged sword, honestly. It's a double-edged sword because you could easily put more money into uh, child welfare uh, systems, but then whose who's agenda is going to be uh, you know, enacted when you put that money and you put those resources into that uh, family welfare system? Right. That mm -hmm. all of a sudden you can your parents have to be a certain way. They can only teach a certain thing or they can only raise their children a certain way or else they can't get the funding. Right. This this is one of those things where we think about we want to have parental freedom, mm -hmm. but we have to recognize that there has to be a way in which parents who are struggling for some reason can reach out and get resources without any kind of string attached to it to get the thing that they need to get them to where they need to be until such time that we can start being cooperative and not competitive. I think we're going to continue to see children um, and teenagers lost, abused, and, and, and otherwise discarded. Hey, it's Tony Bruschi. If you like the podcast, be sure to like, subscribe, and press that bell so you don't miss any of our updates on the cases we're following for you right here at the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. And thanks.